that you, you guys have so much knowledge and you need to recognize that and, you, and when you share it, you'll see just how much you do know and how much you can help each other. So that's, that's the tidbit for the end. Hopefully you'll, you'll buy into it. But scouting basics, basically, you need to record your observations. You know, that's not that you're relinquishing control. It's not that, ooh, I'll get replaced. If I record everything down, they won't need me anymore. If you're an employee, if you're the grower, the owner, you, you tend to forget things. And you, you may not capture the value of that observation. It was at this part of the crop. It was at this time of the year, this growth stage. And if you can see that repeating over the cropping cycle or over years, then learn from that. And the only way you do is to capture that information. And I'll show you some tools to use to capture that information, so some of the digital tools. Even if it is just a IPM notebook where you log things down, and then you flip back and go, oh yeah, that's what happened. I remember that from last year. Now you can be prepared, because um, who was it? Carlos Santiana said, uh, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And that, that illustrious Democrat, Karl Marx, he said, uh, the first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. It's like, you idiot. <laughs> you did it again. Uh, you should know. So learn from your mistakes, learn from your successes by recording it, right? And um, that's what, you know, having apps, there's lots of uh, ways to record, whether it's a, vi a voice memo, you take pictures or video, uh, there's IPM notebooks where you actually will, will uh, have fields for recording what the plant is, where on the plant, the time, the damage, the symptoms that you see. Uh, toolkit. Of course, I always have my nerd pack with me, but I never go anywhere without a hand lens, right? So I need to have something that I need to inspect my plants, my animals. Insects are small, thrips are small, aphids. What good aphid is it, you know? Because aphids have different behaviors, different species. So I always have a hand lens, maybe some containers in case you're not certain about something and you want to take it out of the, the crop and, and look at it under a microscope or under better light and so you have your hand lens somewhere else. But to be able to capture some of those organisms, maybe a camera. I mean, these cameras are getting really, really, really uh, high resolution now. You can get upwards of, what is it, the new Nokia cameras are you know, 20 megapixels. They're just beautiful, beautiful cameras. And you can actually buy little screw-on lenses, clip-on lenses that go on your smartphone. And it's, I'm not an Apple uh, fanboy, so just because I'm using <coughs> Apple gear, but you can use uh, any of the Android material. And these lenses clip on, and they'll give you really high magnification pictures. So there's, all, and they, I think it's like 30 bucks. Um, you can get them uh, sometimes on really good sales for $16. So there's a lot of tools out there for you to use. Uh, stay current. That's what you're doing today, is it not? You're here to learn about what's, what's sort of the bleeding edge, what's new, what's out there, what should I be aware of. But don't do it just once a year at this great conference. But Routinely read, you know, Greenhouse Canada. Go check websites, and not just the uh, Saskatchewan websites. Check the Ontario ones. Check uh, California, because some of the larger institutions and, and uh, states and provinces can have a lot of information. Now, maybe it's like, oh, well, that's Ontario, but you can get a heads up because, of course, my next session is new threats. And where is it coming from? Ontario. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, they're coming from all over the place, basically worldwide. So that's something that you need to do is, is to stay current so that something doesn't catch you unawares or you know what to look for in your crop to go, uh-oh, I, I, I've now got this pest. I, you know, I haven't had it before. Or I have a, a population of a pest that has a, a particular pesticide resistance. Uh-oh, I'm now at the mercy of someone else's mistakes because my good management is now out the window because it's a resistant population. Well, how would you detect that unless you were looking for that and knew that something like that is coming down the line. So, Now, detecting a problem, and this is where I frame it as signs and symptoms. And if you get into your head, the sign, that's the smoking gun. That's the evidence you can convict in a court of law, where you can actually see, and it's, it's unambiguous, it's absolute. This is the culprit. This is the cause, because symptoms how many different things can cause yellowing in a plant? Just about everything, right? <laughs> Could it be the roots? Could it be a stem rot? Could it be uh, it's, dry, it's dry? Oh, is it uh, too much heat? You know, there's all so many things that cause wilting. How about yellowing? Oh, it's, 
Is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it nutrient toxicity? Is it, is it a disease? The plant's response, the plant's only has so many, I don't know, costumes it can wear, only so many ways it can respond to threats or uh, stresses. So to have you rely on a symptom to trigger your actions or to uh, adjust your, your methods, because ultimately that's what we're doing here, right? We're responding in, in a lot of cases. You don't know what the cause is. That symptom is circumstantial evidence. You can't convict in a court of law. So in the big bug court of law, you can't convict the symptoms. You have to delve a little further and come up with that evidence. And so I'll show you some pictures. Uh, Frass is uh, a solid or semi-solid form of uh, excrement. Sorry, hope you guys had breakfast. It's all down, sitting nicely. Uh, we'll be talking about excrement. Uh, honeydew sounds nice, but it's a liquid form of excrement. And it has some extra problems with it. Silk webbing. Spider mites produce silk, but so do some other organisms. And uh, maybe they're not a problem, but we'll have to be able to differentiate between spider silk and spider mite silk. Exuvia, fancy word for, I took my clothes off, right? That's what insects do. They shed their exoskeleton when they go through their developmental stages. Well, there's direct evidence of who's doing <coughs> what. Because they may have fed and gone, and then you go, oh no, oh, they left the glove. They left their wallet, stupid robber, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So you see that direct evidence. Sometimes you see the insect itself, but we have to be careful. See bug, kill bug dead. Not a good idea. We have to identify that insect first to ensure that's the one that causes the problem. And it's not actually one of the insects that's helping us, like a beneficial that's flowing in, or maybe one of the biocontrols that you've released in your greenhouse, right? And lastly, although this can be kind of touchy, is that characteristic feeding damage. Right? You, you, know, you, you know that uh, if it's a bear, you're going to have big claw marks and a big chomp mark on you. And OK, that was a bear, not a hamster. All right, I can pretty, pretty much uh, you know, make the difference. But with insects, some of them do have very characteristic feeding. Only that kind of insect or mite could have caused that kind of damage. No problem. Even though I don't see the animal, I don't see its waste products, I you know, don't see any of its shed exoskeletons, but no one else does this. So we have to get to know some of those characteristic feeding behaviors, and that way we can make that diagnosis. You're all bug doctors. Yes, there you go. Symptoms, not so much. Um, some of the galls, the pseudo galls we'll talk about, might be characteristic, but you know, wilting, chlorosis, um, you know, fruit drop, you know, who knows? Multitude of causes, you have to look further. Don't rely on symptoms alone. So for frass, uh, here we have little bits of black pepper on your leaves, and you're going, oh, what's this? If it's a more solid form of, of excrement, it's, it tends to be a larger animal. Uh, it's not feeding exclusively on liquids. It's feeding more on the solids. In this case, this is thrips frass. And thrips don't drink the way aphids do. Thrips call, are what's called punch and suck. They actually pierce into the individual cells, take out the entire cell contents. So they're raiding the refrigerator. They're not just going in to get a, a glass of milk. So they're, they're eating everything. Therefore, they're going to have much more solid waste, for the most part. Uh, whereas aphids, you can see, I don't know if you can see this very well, it's kind of shiny. That honeydew that rains down, all that liquid, because they're piercing into the plant and sucking all that assimilate out, all the plant sap. So they're on a strictly a liquid diet. So they're going to have liquid waste. So just by looking at the waste, I can tell whether, okay, it's aphids or it's mealybugs or it's uh, soft scale insects, you know, these liquid feeding insects versus, oh no, this is thrips or these are going to be ligus bugs or they're going to be caterpillars like cabbage looper or it's something other than, than a piercing sucking liquid feeder. So you can just categorize right away. What's one thing you can do with a pesticide that, uh, to, depending on type, if you know it's a liquid feeder and it's getting a big dose of plant sap, what kind of product might you use in, to trap tackle that kind of critter? Soil drench. <coughs> Which means it goes into the plant. Into the plant, systemic. Right? So you're using a systemic because you know that if it's going to get a big enough dose. Thrips don't get a big enough dose, which is why uh, systemics tend not to work as effectively against thrips, because they're only taking a small sample of the material out of the plant. Right? So 
that's, I mean, that's why plants themselves produce their own systemic insecticides, right? I mean, when you extract pyrethrum from chrysanthemum, that's its own insecticide that it's produced. It's systemic. It's throughout the whole system. And that's good against piercing sucking insects. Whereas if it's solid material, solid waste, it won't get as much of a dose. So you'd have to use a contact product or a biocontrol. I mean, you can use bios, of course, against uh, piercing sucking. But this is a way you could just make a simple pest management decision by looking at poop. There you go. It's that easy. It's like when you're hiking down a trail. That's coyote scat, or that's wolf, or that, OK, I'm a little worried. That's bear. You need to get off that trail, right? You make a decision just by looking at poop. Yay! Um, another thing that's funny, do is then you get a secondary effect, and that is sooty mold, because honeydew has a high sugar content, high carbohydrate content, so you'll actually get a mold growing on that material. So while the insects themselves might not be causing much damage, their excrement does cause damage. Um, there's always a flip side, though. Not everything is completely evil, for the most part. Uh, but these things, if you have honeydew coming out, parasitic wasps, so if you're in your biocontrol programs, they'll actually drink that honeydew as a form of gasoline. So it's like gas in their tank. If they can't get a nectar source, they'll drink honeydew. So they're actually using some of the excrement from their host to fuel their attack, which is kind of creepy, but uh, that's what they do. So it isn't all bad, but certainly that is a diagnostic character. If, you're, if you haven't looked underneath at the leaves or on the stems, but you see a shiny surface, then you, that's, that, I mean, you can walk up and down your rows and go aphid, 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 without ever having to see a real aphid just by looking at the honeydew. So another diagnostic tool. As far as webbing goes, ooh, that sort of washed out. Um, you would see it on the stems of material, but you can hopefully see that, right? That bridal veil Gerbera, eh, it's not going to sell. <laughs> so, uh, but that's like a little, a little far gone. But spider mites, they put that material out for several reasons. One is so they can move about the plant very easily. Number two is, just like a spider, it traps predators and natural enemies, because they're going through this webbing going, I'm not adapted to walking on this stuff. I get all stuck. It creates a microhabitat that protects them from water and excess moisture. So it also lets them put their eggs in a safe place that will stick to the plant so that the eggs don't tumble off and roll away, because they're nice round spheres. They're like the caviar of the insect world, these nice juicy spider mite eggs. So, you know, seeing that kind of webbing, you go, okay, I've been ignoring my plants too long. I haven't been looking for these things. So when you know you've got a lot of webbing around, spiders, <clears throat> a number of different uh, families and groups of spiders, predators, all spiders good, yes, all spiders good, they're hunters, and, but they will sometimes come into your crop and they'll fold the leaf over and tie it down because that's a nurse web. And so if you were to peel that open, you'd find a whole bunch of little eggs and possibly spiderlings. So if you get creeped out by spiders, don't open one up. Uh, <laughs> because there'd be all of a sudden be hundreds of little spiderlings there. But uh, sometimes you might see a folded leaf. Now, typically, we don't get leaf rollers into a greenhouse setting. Uh, you'll see them more out in your orchard, in your, in your, um, in your landscape. Um, <laughs> But if you do see folded leaves in the greenhouse, chances are it's probably a spider that's moved in and has formed a nursery web. And so that's an okay thing. Whereas the spider mites, it tends to be considerably more diffuse, right? And you can see the little spider mites, it's almost like they're hanging in midair, but that's them in their webbing. So that's a good diagnostic tool. How many of these things are actually alive? You might inspect a leaf and go, oh my goodness, I'm way over my threshold. I've got to nuke the joint. No, a lot of those are those cast off exoskeletons. But even if, say, these aphids are gone, there's still the remnants of their presence. And so even after the fact, you can still diagnose who done it. Now, maybe not the species, it's a little difficult, although thinking uh, this one might be a, let's see, a uh, violet aphid just because of the banding on the antennae. But you can still somewhat see what was there, whether it was an aphid, whether it was a thrips, whether it was, oh, could it be a white fly or you know any of these other kinds of animals that you might encounter. So um, looking at the old cast off skins is another diagnostic tool. But don't get fooled into thinking that this constitutes 
you know, seven billion aphids on my leaf, I'm in trouble. Or I've got to order yet another round of biocontrols because the last one didn't work. No, these exoskeletons are ex, right, early life stages. So don't let it confuse you when you're doing your, your, your sampling to determine how many are there. Now, with characteristic feeding damage, Stippling is a very specific term, and it refers to how spider mites feed. And I'm going to, uh, oh, there will be math today. There will, I'm sorry. But uh, basically, here's a plant cell, and it's surrounded by other plant cells. What's the difference between an animal cell and a plant cell? One big difference. Cell wall, right? A rigid cell wall. So what a spider mite does is it pierces into the cell wall and takes out just the chloroplast, just that symbiotic bacterium that lives inside of plant cells, because it's, it's the cheeseburger. It's got full of protein and everything, so it's a real high, high quality meal. But that means the rest of the cell bleeds out, because it had a hole put in it and just one parcel taken out. And the rest of the cell bleeds out, and the cell dies. And all of the neighboring cells go, oh no, Fred's dead. What happened? <gasps> and they all commit suicide. <laughs> They're all so distraught. But what happens is, is you're absolutely right. There is this rigid cell wall. And that means these cells go, uh oh, something killed my neighbor. I'm not going to let it go any farther. So there's little um, vacuoles, little pouches of enzymes in each cell. Um, they are called lysosomes. And what they do is they're basically the trash compactor. They break down toxins and waste products, etc. So they're full of um, really corrosive enzymes, really active enzymes. And so what they do is they just basically open that up and they turn themselves into toxic pools so that whatever killed Fred, if it gets into me, it's going to stop. It's going to stop right there. If it's a bacteria or a fungus, it's going to stop. So you get this wall of death around X Fred. And so that means on a leaf that you'll see the spider mite feed here. There's a ring of death. And it goes, well, all these cells are dead. Ugh. I'm going to go feed over here. Ring of death. Over here. Ring of death. Over here. See that? So it's stippling. You see all these little spots all over the place. And that's characteristic of spider mites. So you can look at a leaf and go, oh, there's these little spots. It's got measles or little lesions. And if it's spread out like that, it's more characteristic of spider mites, even if you don't see the webbing or you don't see the spider mites themselves. So that's stippling. Whereas thrips, it's more patchy. When a thrips feeds on a plant cell, like I said, it consumes everything in the cell. It punches in, forms a mouth cone, and sucks it up like a milkshake. Just takes the entire contents out. So Ginger, George, Ringo, they're all just doo -de doo -de doo They have no idea that Fred's dead. And so then the thrips moves to the next cell right next door. And so you get this patch. And it's only limited because they're going to the bathroom as they're feeding. And so they're feeding, and they go, oh, oh, there's where I just went to the bathroom. OK, I'll move over and do another patch. So thrips feeding is fairly characteristic when it's feeding on leaves. Now, I'll show you here where there's deformed growth. This is, was going to be a nice, straight, long English cucumber, but instead it's curled over. Because just like if you, uh, oh, I'm going to go through this puppy really quick. I'll just turn it around and use the backside. So if I have something that's supposed to grow, Right? in all these directions. I grow by the cells getting somewhat bigger, but I grow by cell division, correct? So I multiply all these cells. Well, if I kill a few cells here by thrips, punch, and sucking out all the contents, well, these cells are still dividing, and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and these ones are not. What's going to happen? It curls around, so you get deformed fruit. Because right? this is not expanding, but that is. And so if I'm growing, and this isn't, you curve around the dead tissue. So you get uh, deformed fruit, you get deformed leaf margins, you get deformed flowers when they're feeding in the bud. 
So D4 growth is very characteristic of early trips feeding, cyclamid mite feeding, even ligus feeding, ligus bugs, when you're seeing that. Because it's an animal that's puncturing, puncturing into the cell, killing that localized group of cells. It's not an aphid, it's not a scale, it's not a mealybug, it's not a white fly that's draining a lot of fluid. Very characteristic. Now, puckering, we're seeing this more and more from leaf hoppers. This is sort of a, a, a cross between the sign and the symptom, because it is a bit of a plant response. We get leaf hoppers coming in from outdoors, and some of them are setting up shop in some greenhouse, especially cucumbers, and they're feeding away, and I'll show you some other damage. They're feeding away, and the leaf puckers in response. And we see this outdoors, we call it leafhopper burn. The leafhopper saliva is quite toxic to the plant. So the leafhopper is spitting into the plant to lubricate its mouth parts so it can suck up food, and the plant's going, oh, dude, garlic. And so the, the leaf puckers up. And, and you see this very characteristic puckering with some browning, and the tissue's dying. The plant's trying to maybe shed some of that toxin to the leaf margins. So the leaf margins tend to brown off. It's like burning, like you're shedding some kind of herbicide. So yeah, keep your eyes open for that puppy. So uh, yeah, well, here I'll show you again. Is uh, this is also leaf hoppers, right here, taking that little little bite there. So the cucumber itself isn't being deformed. This is after it's grown, and then the leaf hoppers are coming in, and even the fruit tends to pucker from that. The fruit tends to pucker from that, and uh, as opposed to say a thrips feeding on a pepper or a tomato, and then that those dead cells being elongated, and that scar showing up on the fruit later. Now with symptoms, yellowing, I don't know, tons of reasons. You have to look. Is it a root issue? Is it a stem issue? Is it a nutrient issue? Is it intervenal? Is it over the whole plant? Is it just that one limb? Is it so? Uh, unfortunately, we can get yellowing from aphid feeding, right? Sucking the lifeblood out of the plant, or from white fly feeding. Sometimes you can see that that you know sort of weakness in the plant. So, double check: was it that their emitter hose was clogged, or there's a valve failure, so that whole uh, row or bench is not getting fed? Was it? Um, you know, something that uh, is near the, the margins of the greenhouse, so it got a cold shock. Uh, there are numerous reasons. So just because you see something like wilting or yellowing, don't immediately say, oh, I've got to respond as if it were this insect. You need to dig a little deeper. Is it a disease issue? Is it an agronomic issue? Is it a pest issue? So for most part, with plant symptoms, you need to look deeper into it. You can't convict with circumstantial evidence. Similarly with galls, we don't get this too much in the greenhouse, but it depends. How many of you are actually expanding into, say, native grasses, native plants for green roofs or living walls or uh, xeriscaping? Anybody into any of those uh, ornamentals that are a little specialty? Uh, many people are having, in uh, at least Calgary, I know it's a weird place on the planet, it's atypical, but uh, many of the uh, head offices are bringing a lot of plant material, right? Keep the workers happy. Uh, little office drones in their cubicles. So we want to oxygenate the, the office air. So they're bringing in trees and all kinds of things. And well, along with that comes a lot of what we consider to be landscape pests. So if, you're not, if you don't have a tree nursery, you're not s supplying landscapers currently, maybe you will look into that as more and more uh, families are getting into urban agriculture. So they're mixing their landscape with their gardening. It isn't just the garden plot. It's even the urban hipsters in their uh, condos and their balconies, they're having like their pot of herbs, not the herb, but herbs. Uh, they have, uh, you know, sort of fixed, you know, remember you buy, sell a six pack for a buck and a and change, whereas I, you know, put them into a pot, I sell it for $23. They're stupid, let's do this. <laughs> right? Let's maximize. But what you're doing is you're adding value, are you not? You're the one who's thinking what goes together. You're the one who's preparing it in a more elaborate uh, container. So they should pay for your expertise. But you can go beyond just sort of the traditional landscape ideas and start exploiting some of these attitudes about green, about functional landscapes. So food and ornamental simultaneously mixed. And you're going to start to see some of those outdoor problems 
in your greenhouse if you're propagating those plants in a controlled environment for sale. So you're accelerating so that they can get a, a fixed mid-season looking garden right out of the box, basically. So there's a real value added opportunities in that regard. The reason why I say this is I also teach in the landscape program and more and more landscape designers are designing just that. Functional landscapes, urban agriculture, mixed function uh, landscapes for people. So uh, we have these beautiful, beautiful uh, artichokes that are flowering on our campus. Well, not anymore, uh, it being November. But, you know, the kale, you know, it's not just for chips anymore. It's, uh, you know, so all kinds of vegetables are being used as ornamental plants. And then they're also, hey, I'll eat this while I'm at it, kind of thing. So it's something to think about. But goals. This is not uh, someone sticking their gum underneath the table, right? Uh, so on the leaf, but actually it is a woody growth. And these are aerophyte mites. Uh, we commonly see them out in woody perennials, uh, things called trees. And uh, these things, they, they get in there, they start feeding, and the plant goes, boy, <coughs> sector 12 sure has a high nutrient drain. I'm not gonna have it produce epidermal tissue or you know soft tissues. I'm going to have to have it produce plumbing, you know, like a vascular tissue, woody tissue. So the hormones are tricked. The plants trick into secreting growth regulators and growth hormones that change. You're a stem cell, you're no longer going to be a parenchyma cell, you're going to be something else. And that's the mite or the insect going, thank you very much, you built me a house and you're delivering pizza to the door. Oh, how well good is life? Because that's what happens. This is more woody tissue and more nutrient is being directed into these little areas. The animal's housed and it's fed. What are you going to do about that? That's architectural damage. There's not much you can do once it's there. This will not heal. This will not drop off with an insecticide treatment. So it's a matter of getting to know the timing. So this is, okay, I detect this symptom, this response by the plant, but it tells me I better be prepared for the next growing cycle or the next reproductive cycle of that mite that I'm going to have to treat it with a soap or a, or a, a summer oil or a dormant oil, you know, to, to smother that uh, material. A pseudo gall, you know, this is an elm tree. Nobody goes elm trees in their greenhouse. I don't think so. <coughs> no, good. Uh, I'd be kind of weird. Uh, but a lot of plants, we get aphids that will cause the leaf not to form a woody growth, although some aphids will cause a, like a pemphigus gall at the base of a a poplar leaf, it's a big woody carbuncle, but they cause the leaf to curl and maybe pucker a bit. Has anyone, you know, grown currants at all? Black currants? Red currants? Blink, blink, blink. No? Yes? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, have you seen the, the leaves get all red and puckery? That's from a, an aphid. It's a current aphid. Hey, we call them as we see them, let me tell you. Uh, so that's a current aphid that causes that leaf to pucker. That's like a pseudo gall to a certain extent. Uh, but the, this particular example is on elm, and the leaf rolls over. And if you uncurl the leaf, there's all these aphids inside. So if we're getting into a little bit more experimental growth with different kinds of ornamental plants, you might see some aphids coming indoors and actually being able to survive in a controlled environment where you see these other kinds of growth. Just saying. Um, lesions, puncture wounds. Is it disease? Is it insect? Disease, insect. Especially, oh, I mean, here's your smoking gun. But say they were washed off at the last irrigation event, if you had overhead uh, irrigation. So all the aphids are gone, and all you see is these, these lesions, these spots. And one thing to think about is disease is just that. The cell dies, and then the fungus or the bacteria spread. So you have sort of brown dead. And then you have sort of yellowish zone, and then you might have just a, a faint discoloration. Disease tends to spread like a stain, right? So there's a little bit of harm at the leading edge. It's dead at the center. Insects tend to, I stab you, that's it, that, that cell's dead. And except for spider mites, right, where Fred's buddies all get in a circle and die. Uh, it stays right there because of those hard cell walls. Whereas disease is a growing stain. And you should be able to tell the difference between a disease, like each spore that has germinated and starting to spread, because it'll be brown, then yellowish, 
whereas these are very discreet. You can see, like, it's ragged there. They follow exactly which cells were killed when they put their mouth parts through. So insect damage tends to be very discreet. Not discreet as in, you know, they keep things behind closed doors, but discreet as in finite edges, you know, restricted to individual cells. Something to think about. All right, monitoring methods. You can be active or you can be passive. If you're passive, I pull out the Nerf bat and start beating on you. Uh, honestly, I threaten my students with hitting them with a stick. Uh, the lawyers tell me not to, but I have to really get it pulled to them. I would, of course, never physically abuse them. But um, I mean, you're, you're not using baited traps. You're just putting something out there that has no visual cue, no olfactory or smell cue, no sound cue, no, you know, no, nothing to bring them in, right? Or you're doing other stuff. And you're just like, oh, bug, do, do, do. oh, snake. You know, you just, like, what kind of method is that? I, would, I ask, I beg you, <coughs> please turn pest management, whether it be weeds, diseases, insects, and other arthropods, not as something you do in addition to my regular duties, but it has to be a purpose-driven activity. If someone's going out to do some sort of maintenance in the crop, if it's also to go out and scout the crop, make sure that they have as much focus on the scouting, as much rigor, as much discipline on the scouting as they are to the other maintenance, whether it's deleafing or what have you, right? So it can't be just casual, haphazard, ad hoc, whatever adjective you want to throw at it, right? It needs to be as disciplined, because is it, it's as important as any other activity you're going to do. Because here's the thing, you put all this energy into growing, Disease and insects and weeds are competing and actively destroying that growth. So I would expect that the effort and the emphasis that you put into the growing should be equal to the emphasis and effort you put into the protection of that growth, right? The prevention of loss of that growth of that yield. So I'm going to focus exclusively on active. So plant inspection, that's where your handy hand lens comes into play. Look at the plant in a systematic way. Inspect the leaf. Look at the leaf. Upper side, underside. Most insects are cryptic. They like to hang out on the underside. If you're having problems with distorted growth, you need to look at the growing points. Look at that meristematic tissue. Look at those buds. See if there's something around there. If the fruit is in danger, inspect the fruit, right? So you have to physically look at things. To, and not just walk up and down the aisles or scan the benches. You do need, these are small animals. I mean, you're, you're not looking for jackals and yaks. I mean, you can skip <coughs> them from a little ways away. These things you have to be pretty attentive to. And the reason I say it has to be, yo, uh, we'll go back? Sure. What is that? These are aphids? Yeah, these are aphids? Yeah, yeah. They're not always green. And I'll show you some in the next talk, if you stick around. Um, aberrant strain, pink strain, uh, melon aphid go, can go from green all the way to a really dark black. So there's every color under the sun. I used to think aphids were like one of the ugliest insects on the planet. And then I saw a presentation by a researcher who works on aphids. And she put up some beautiful pictures. So not quite converted, but uh, there's, 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 you know, they're not all weird Uncle Ed. Uh, there, there's a few redeeming ones, and actually I saw one, I was at a, called by a horticulturalist to a golf course, uh, and I always thought golf courses, nothing was taller than this, right, you know, turf, uh, but there's lots of plants, and trees and things, and so the horticulturist there showed me, unfortunately, their willows and poplars were just being hammered, and it's called the giant willow aphid, it's actually a fair size aphid, not this big, uh, but it's a fair size aphid, it's gorgeous, and I was like gushing over it, saying, like, oh, it's so beautiful, and she's like, Really? Can? Really? Uh, and, and, but it, I mean, they can be attractive. You get them under a uh, hand lens and they can be attractive. But here's the deal. We were doing some work with a greenhouse and we were sampling for western flower strips. So each one of these is a, a, a range. And so you can see those, these are real data. So the height of the bar indicates how many thrips were in that, on that bench or that area. So it's not uniform, is it? Like, you know, the edges, obviously, they were getting in, you know, material coming in from their beds. Uh, here they had a particular species of plant that they were uh, propagating here, but not here. So the distribution of thrips within their greenhouses 
was uneven. So of course you're going to have to, if you just see bug, you can't just nuke the range. You have to be particular. If you want to have effective and economical use of product, whether it's biologicals, um, naturally extracted pesticides that are organically certified, or synthetic insecticides, you should be very strategic, precise, scalpel, not axe. Think that. So, how are we going to monitor? For you youngins out there, I know random, you've taken on as the new word, uh, everything's so random. Oh, you're destroying a perfectly good statistical term. Uh, random is just that, it's the most objective, right? You have a grid pattern, uh, whether it's by row, by bench, whatever, and then you essentially assign coordinates to each of these grid squares, and then you randomly sample them. Use a random number uh, generator. There's a website, the randomizer.com. And you just get random numbers. It'll generate a whole sampling pattern for you. And the problem is, is I'm going to walk to here, and I'm going to look at my coordinates, I'm going to walk to there, and I'm going to walk to there, and I'm going to walk to here, and I'm going to walk to there. It's labor intensive. But it gives you the least biased method. The least biased method. Because I don't want to spray today. I don't want to spray today. I see nothing. I see nothing. You know, you might have a worker who does not want to put on the Tyvek suit, does not want to put on the mask, you know, get out the spray rig, and away you go. Other people go, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. And they overestimate. So you can have an underestimate error and an overestimate error. So this takes some of that human subjectivity out of it. But it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's labor intensive. So what we do is we recommend a systematic way of looking at it. And I have to give kudos to the we people. Uh, I know this is an M, but if you turn it upside down, it's the W. Uh, you park your truck at one end of the field, you do your W, and you come out at the same side of the field. Us entomologists, we were stupid. We were parking our truck here and going out and ending up over here. <laughs> <laughs> not that dumb. Uh, but the we people figured it out and publicized it really well. So what you do is you set a specific track through your your greenhouse. I'm going to hit rows one, three, five, seven, nine, and I'm going to hit the fifth plant, every fifth plant. This way it's not, okay, I know that one's infested, but I'm trying to get an unbiased statistical sampling. If you do see, of course, a plant that's just hammered, well clearly either rogue it out or you're going to spot treat that one. Yeah, I mean, don't ignore a real hot spot, but if it's a sort of uniform or reasonably uniform distribution of pests. And then I can record that, okay, I found that mostly in these rows here, well, that's going to release my bios. It's just right here, instead of treating the whole range. So it is effective, because you're getting edges, you're getting in the middle, it's not being biased. Like, I don't want to walk all the way down the row, you know, I don't want to go all the way down there, I'll just sample the ones on the edge, right? Uh, don't be biased that way. Be as unbiased as possible. Here's the math. Sample size. They always say, um, how many samples should I take? Is it five samples? Is it ten samples? Depending on size of operation. Usually 50 is a, is a really good number to work with. Uh, say per acre. Uh, maybe per, per bench, depending on how many species you have. You have to determine this for each pest. I know, it's a little bit of work at first. But then you've got the heavy lifting done, and you've got a reliable sample size because there's nothing more satisfying than I do my work, I get my data collection, and it's reliable such that when I make a decision based on those data, I have a high probability of success. I don't have to treat. I do have to treat. I have to burn the place down, whatever it is. If you can reliably get predictable results from your decisions and your actions, it's worth that little bit of work up front. So, I, so I'd so i say three, five, seven, three, five, two, five, uh, eight, fifteen, twenty-three, thirty. Thirty, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I should have picked an easier number. Uh, there it goes into their four point, four and change, say. 4.2. So that's the average number of critters I found from all those samples. So I say I took 10 samples, I find the average. I'm going to take 10 more samples, and then I'm going to take all of them and get an average, so it's out of 20, right? This was out of 10. 
So now I've actually doubled my sample size and say my, my uh, average for that was 4.5. And then I'm going to do it again and again and again until I've had 50 samples taken. And I calculate the average for 50. And if my average is 4.6, I've taken 50 samples and the average that I find per sample is 4.6. If I just took 10 samples and the average is 4.2, that's not close enough to 4.6. Right? It's probably more than 10% away. But if I took you know, 20 samples and my average is 4.5, well, that's pretty close to 4.6, isn't it? Why should I take 50 samples when I can get just as much accuracy with 20 samples? I only have to take 20 samples from now on. And this is based on the law of diminishing returns. So as I put more effort into something, I get a return, but at some point, I get a diminished return. So say I take 10 samples, I get this level of accuracy. Maybe I'm 25% accurate. I take 20 samples, and I'm 80% accurate with 20 samples. If I take 50 samples, say that's my 100% accuracy with 50. Well, if I take another 30 samples, I'm only gaining a little bit of accuracy, aren't I? But if I go from 10 to 20 samples, I'm gaining a huge increase in accuracy. So find out what that point of diminishing return is. Why work any harder than you have to? Take only as many samples as is necessary. And they look at, um, as far as numbers go, if you're within 10% of that total number, you're 90% confident that my lesser number here, 20 samples, is as accurate as my 50 samples. Maybe you want to be 95% comfortable. Maybe you want to be 99% confident. Maybe you don't mind flipping a coin and you're only 50% confident. You know, it's up to you. You know what your labor costs are. You know what your training level is. You know what the, the value of your crop is. Do you not? So you need to weigh the amount of effort you put into protecting that crop with the value that you get out from selling that crop. So if you can afford to lose 30% of your crop to pests or disease, but you, you're not willing to put in the labor, that's up to you. I mean, only you can do those sums. That's why I don't have a fixed number for you. I just have a, an example. Okay, we're still not done here. My watch must be slow. That's got so fast. Okay. Uh, painted traps. Yellow sticky traps. Yellow. It's a color. That's a bait. That's a lure. That's an attractant. Blue for thrips. Yellow for just about everything else. White for ligus bugs, right? Here's a pheromone trap for cabbage loopers. It's sending out a smell. Oh, a lovely scent of sex. It's a sex pheromone. It's luring the males in. And they get caught in the trap, and you can detect, ooh, I've got this many cabbage loopers. Or the adults are there, they're starting to lay eggs. I better get ready with the BT. It's long as you're not in British Columbia, and they've got resistant populations. So just saying. Uh, a white trap. A bug zapper. Ta-da! There's a new aphid trap that's being touted. Uh, essentially, it's a white. And you have a fan. It was originally a mosquito trap. It's called a CDC trap. I mean, it would emit carbon dioxide, and we don't need it anymore. Uh, you have a little light, and the aphids will fly to it. And they get sucked into, in, into a little gauze bag. It's working really well in some uh, uh, greenhouses on the coast. So there's all kinds of traps. Uh, you can put uh, chemical scents onto sticky cards. Vanilla. Can you pick up for that? Oh, the aphid trap? Uh, on my computer back at work. It's, it's the picture I have is kind of a, I don't own the picture, there's copyright to it. Uh, it was sent to me by, you guys know Brian Spencer? Applied Biodynamics, BC, anyway. Uh, he's, he's seen that some growers develop it in California and in the, in the Fraser Valley. Uh, so it is essentially a incandescent light, so don't throw out all your incandescent lights. Uh, but I suppose a, a fluorescent would work sort of well. Um, and it's just a small fan, a small fan, and it sucks the aphids as they come up to light, it sucks them in, and there's just a gauze bag so that the air will flow through the bag, but the aphids won't. 
Um, if you leave me your card, I can easily email you a picture of it. I'll, I'll share sure. it with you. And um, what I might do is uh, I can share that image with the Saskatchewan Greenhouse Growers Association, so you might want to cob together one of your own. Right? You guys are innovative. Um, what is it? You add vanilla to um, sticky traps and trips are more inclined to, to come to them. Right? Um, you could use trap plants. Here's a, a tobacco plant in a Gerbera crop. White flies prefer tobacco over Gerbera. Gerbera, Gerbera, whatever. Potato, potato. Um, and in this case, this particular grower just nuked this with a bit of clothing. And so the white flies would come to the trap crop and die. So um, here's a, we put out some flowering plants for the thrips to go at. So you have, if you're staging your ornamentals, you know the thrips are pollen lovers, western flower thrips anyway, Put out something that's actively generating pollen, and that's a lure, that's a trap crop. So some nice yellow marigolds. Uh, just, oh, they hoover up those, those thrips like crazy. Add a little vanilla extract, and it's like, oh, catnip. And so you're, you're, you're playing on that insect's natural tendencies. I want to go to this preferred host. I want to go to you know, this preferred smell. This smells like food. I will gravitate to that. This is the color I like. So that's the kind of thing that you want to go for. And counter to some of my previous experiences here where I've talked for over 11 hours, uh, I've actually been able to make this one a, a reasonable amount of time uh, without running over, because I, I, I apologize if I've never gone over before. But what I want to do is um, there's some apps that are really handy. There's a lot of, I, on your sheet, I'll, I'll show you a couple of those digital identification guides. But um, here's one, it's supposed to be for school kids. I'm sorry it's on its side, and even if I do this, it's still not going to look upright for you. Uh, for whatever reason, this thing was designed for a phone, not an iPad. So normally you would have it right here, nice and easy to see. But uh, basically it's for kids, it's called the NOAA project, like Noah's Ark, right? And you go out and here, my spottings. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Come on. Wake, 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 wake. Oh, I don't want to sign in. Do I have to sign in? No, I don't want to sign in. Just go to my stuff, cancel. Wake, but oh, it's, uh, this worked in my hotel room so good. Oh, man. Um, okay, I'll see if I can get this to work. Connection, okay, uh, I'm not on the internet here, that's why. Uh, for whatever reason, I can go on the website, but uh, in my hotel room, I was doing this last night. And Never mind. Uh, so if I go with that, so I'll just left. Because I know that we have silver as the keyword. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for whatever reason. So, I mean, if I'm going to go. Anyway, what I'll do is I'll show you a couple of these. Project Noah is one. BioVest has a side effects chart you download. Um, so if you're looking at it, are my bios going to survive? Strictly speaking, no. Um, there's a lot of turf management ones. It's ridiculous. Golf course is really expensive. Um, here's a cool one, leaf snap. If you don't know what the plant is, if you have customers coming into your garden center saying, I want to buy this. What is this? I saw this. You take a picture of the leaf and it comes back with an identification. Now it's for northeastern United States, so you get a lot of beach and things like that. Question? Uh, what was the one before that? Biovest? Biovest. Yeah, this is uh, one of the suppliers, Comfort's another, Applied Bionomics is another, Natural Insect Control, Bug Factory. There's all kinds of bio control suppliers. Biovest is out of Belgium. They've actually put their um, side effects chart. So if you have this biological control agent and you use this chemical, <laughs> does it kill it or not? What's the you know, re-entry interval for the bios, not just for the people, that kind of thing? So. But I use those with a word of caution because most chemicals are quite toxic to the biological control agents. And strictly speaking, for the most part, they're mutually incompatible. I know that uh, some folks are saying, yeah, you can like do a cleanup or you can start out your crop fresh and then introduce the bios. But bios have not been subjected to spray after spray after spray. So they're quite naive and quite vulnerable to pesticides. Pesticide residues tend to stick to the plastic or the glass and stay toxic for weeks on end. Maybe not to the pest, but to the bios. So be, be forewarned about that. Here's that garden bugs one. This one, entomology. It's a glossary. Oh, I read in a fact sheet there was some such you know, structure. What does this mean? Cornicle. What's a cornicle? It's 
the butt tubes coming out of an aphid, so you know it's an aphid. Uh, sorry, butt tubes coming out of an aphid, so you know it's an aphid. And so this is a dictionary, a glossary of entomological terms. So there's a bunch of different uh, apps you can go for. Um, but what I will do is go back to the presentation. And let's see, this is where citizen science comes in. So you should, oh, that's why. Yes, continue. <coughs> Thank you. Maybe now I can go try that out. Yeah. Okay. I don't want that. I want. Uh, I think he just pasted out of there now. Yeah. So now I'll just go. Can we go to Bug Guy? Thank you. So this is citizen science. I didn't know this. The dude who set this up, he's from Oregon State University. I went to grad school with him. I had no idea that he was doing this in his spare time. Really cool. Great Courtney is his name. But what happens is, is you can do an ID request. You submit a digital picture, and entomologists from around the world go, I know what that is. I found the coolest furry millipede I'd ever seen. I didn't know it was a millipede. I didn't know what it was. I uploaded a picture, boom. Within six hours, I had an answer. Now, I can't promise you're going to get an answer every time. But this is what citizen science is all about. You submit all these pictures. You can do it by, oh, OK, it's got this kind of silhouette. So if I press on that one, and it comes up with, Okay, true bugs. Does it look like anything like this? And then you start, you know, tunneling down. And you can and there's so many species. They've got 750,000 images, 125,000 different species already identified. So if you get something flying in from outside your greenhouse and it's not your run-of-the-mill fungus net, aphid, whatever, hey, this could help you out. And what I mean by citizen science, so in my last couple of minutes, this is what it's all about. You can tweet. Set up a Twitter account for the SGGA, and you tweet, you know, hashtag bugs, right? And so you can follow, you can sub subscribe to that account, and, and you can search for that hashtag, a hashtag thrips, and people can tweet their experiences. They can post pictures. You can maybe have a blog, a web blog, right, where people post their material to that. That's social media, that's citizen science. You're saying, this is what I found, this is when I found it, this is where I found it, this is the kind of damage it was causing, here's what worked for me. Oh, I don't know, so nothing's working. Does someone else know? You guys have a ton of experience in your heads. Use it, share it. You're not competitors, you're colleagues. Honestly, the stronger your operation is, the stronger your industry is. So this is where we're getting into real collaborative work with citizen science. So Bug Guide is one aspect. Um, if you're a real keener, um, here we go. Let's go with this one. Agriculture and agri-food entomological monographs. So if you're real hardcore, these are handbooks of insect identification. And there's a whole bunch of them, 26 or something like that. So if you want to know, you know, beetles and journeys to crops. Uh, if you want to know bark beetles, uh, if you want to know weevils, you want to know plant parasitic nematodes, stored product pests, things that eat dead people, um, spiders and mites of Cape Breton Highlands, who knew? So there's, these are hardcore, they're all free. Everything's there for you. So uh, there's a ton of material on the internet. I will give you a word of caution. Just because you Google a term, up comes a picture, you go, there it is. Well, it's only from Zimbabwe. Probably not in your greenhouse. So be careful. The internet is global. The results are global. You have to be aware of that. So we need to get focused information, which is where Saskatchewan Ag and Food comes in, and they've got you know, focused information. Ontario uh, Ministry of Ag and Food has focused information. You know, Alberta Ag, BC, University of California, Davis. These all have focus, and then you slowly take some of that information and apply it to your specific circumstances. But why not have a collective of Saskatchewan growers contributing to their own Saskatchewan database. Pictures of animals, timing of animals, crop preferences of animals. I don't know how many growers of ornamentals have it in their head. Oh yeah, this variety is always getting hammered the most. This variety isn't. None of that's in the scientific literature. It's all in your head. Share that, and then everyone can benefit. And it isn't that they're going to now outcompete you. Honestly, you, you need to grow as an industry and rely on each other's expertise because you are truly experts. And this whole citizen science thing, whether it's marking uh, where monarch butterflies show up, what bird species we see, butterfly counts in the summer, this is huge. 
science is really starting to take advantage of this. And um, there was a, a bumblebee in northeastern United States. It used to be the most common bumblebee in the northeastern United States. It used to be routinely found in Ontario. Nobody had seen it for a decade, right? They thought it had gone extinct. And then someone took a picture, posted it to Imager, and so it was, hey, there it is. It's still alive. And sure enough, some graduate students went out and found it. It's still, it's just basically gone from being all over the Northeast to a few pockets that remain. And it's mostly because of habitat destruction and a little bit of climate change. So it's uh, not so much that it's getting warmer or colder, it's that it's getting freakishly hot and cold, like you're going through menopause. I'm sorry, ladies, my wife's doing that right now, freaking me out. Uh, so, it's these extremes. It can't handle the changes from year to year, so it's wiping this bee out. But that wouldn't have been known. Those specimens wouldn't have been found if it wasn't for people posting images like that. So it's really cool what you can do. You have the power. So that's the message I want to leave you with uh, to end this session. And according to my watch, I am spot on. So there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Association, we thank you. It was very informative. I will have pictures of dead bread in my head for a long time. <laughs> so that was very good. And uh, you're all welcome, to, of course, to stay for the next session. So. And hopefully you have a ample time to make it to a different session should you need to. Project, you were saying that it's a way of tracking your own insects within our Well, yeah, maybe I should try that now that uh, we actually have connectivity. So, ta da! Check it out. These are all animals that kids from around the world and people just like you from around the world have been posting. They post their own missions. So, if I uh, go back to my NOAA, you have my spotting, so my record. So I take pictures, I put data in, so one of my spottings, all right, bing, 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 ah, oh, I got to sign in. Uh, do I want to sign in? Um, sure, go for it. You're going to see my Google password. Um, hopefully you don't see it. Everybody turn that way. <laughs> uh, it's an easy one. It's, so we'll see if they like it. Yes. Okay. So my spottings. Here's one I just put in for show. Uh, birth to army worm. And so if I go and I look at this one, it brings up the image that I posted. Uh, someone likes it. Uh, you can see comments. You can tag it. You can flag it uh, as being important. Um, it says that I made that observation 16 years ago. Um, hey, what are you going to do? Uh, let's see what else we want. Um, you can see where it was tagged, and this is where my research lab was, out in Bakerville, it was in our field plots. Um, you can put all kinds of data in with it. So, uh, you know, if I can throw up common name, scientific name, description, what was it found, what was it doing, where was it, some notes on it. And more importantly is I can put all kinds of links to it. So, I have a Wikipedia link to the Birth of Army Worm page. I have a, a link to the Encyclopedia of Life. Uh, so you can actually populate it with, you know, here's a link to a fact sheet on how to manage it. So just think you have your staff, your IPM scout, the person that the summer student you hired, and they've got all that information, all your previous links before, on where on the plant that you would normally find it, where you're likely to need to look for it, uh, you know, last time you saw it, images of the damage. This is a mission. Right? You can uh, share that as your spottings. And then you can say as a mission. My mission is to categorize the insects on tomato. And other people can then share that information. So, um, and of course, because it's a kitty thing, oops, check back on, is what patches I can earn. Right? I'm just a tadpole right now because I have one spotting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Um, is, I mean, it's, it's for children, but I'm using this in college. I mean, this is great <laughs> stuff to get someone to build because I don't have the propeller head skills, the coding skills, the mad skills to, to generate an app like this. So why don't I take it off the shelf, repurpose it? Yeah. Have you found any apps that are good for creating a scouting program within your greenhouse? Yeah, I found one for turf belt. Okay. So if you don't mind, you know, it's 
And unfortunately, no one's put one out specifically for greenhouses. So if you know any computer propeller heads, it'd be really worthwhile. Otherwise, I'm just co-opting a bunch of other programs. Because that's what we need is a good scouting, generic scouting program. And uh, if we want to make some money, that'd be a place to go. Is to Because it's not that difficult, right? Uh, so I'm told. Uh, to put something, you know, sort of baseline together. But uh, certainly, it's it's worth our while. They're coming on stream. I mean, more and more companies, like say, Bayer Crop Science has one out for field agriculture. There's a big cotton one. There's, I mean, so once again, it's a matter of maybe petitioning the uh, Canadian greenhouse growers organization or your own organization, link up with other provinces, and that might be some seed money that goes to a, a software developer to develop one specifically for you guys. Then what you do? Buck ninety nine, or it's four ninety nine, or seven ninety nine, and that's a revenue stream for your association. Just saying. All right. Um, so, four minutes into it. Hi. Right. Uh, here we go. New greenhouse threats. This is just uh, not to scare you, put the fear into you, but just to bring to your attention some of the animals you might already know about, others that are on the horizon. And this is about staying current. I encourage you. I don't have a handout for this, right? The reason is I'm forcing you to get into the practice checking Saskag and food for bulletins, checking Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food, checking the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. But what? I know they've just been moved under Health Canada. They used to be under Ag Canada. Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the people that can shut you down, uh, they're responsible for Canada's biosecurity. Who knew? So in other words, anything that comes across our border, what? potential harm is there to our food crops, our ornamental crops, our ornamental plants. So the CFIA has a, a, a sort of an FBI's most wanted list of who's who of what's out there, and you can keep aware of it. So I'm going to go through some ones that you think, well, can't we really know about this, but I just got an email um, a couple of days ago, Ligus bugs up the wazoo in chrysanthemum. What's going on? They're breeding right in the mugs. So they're not going anywhere. Uh, really bizarre. It's in California, I know, but we get ligus bugs up the wazoo from our canola crops, right? From our strawberries. Alfalfa, absolutely. Also the alfalfa plant bug, too. So, yeah, they're, they're cousins. Uh, so you, you can see that this is, you know, what's going on? Is it a climate change thing? Is it a crop change thing? Is it a pesticide response thing? We don't know yet, but we need to be aware of it. Potato salads are increasingly coming into tomatoes. Uh, cabbage loopers. I bring this one up because we're starting to see resistant populations in British Columbia, so the biocontrol agent isn't working, so we need to look more at uh, predators, parasitoids. Leaf hoppers are becoming more problematic. Uh, if we're not getting those cold, cold, cold nights, we might actually see more species be able to overwinter here, because most of them are blown up from the south. Thank you very much, United States and Mexico. But uh, we're getting more and more of those blown up, so we have to be aware of that. Uh, DuPont chalia or DuPont kellia. Potato, potato. Uh, this is another animal. We don't have it here yet. Knock on wood. Uh, but it's something you need to be aware of. White flies. There's a biotype that is resistant to neonicotinoid insecticides. Uh, green pea tea that I'll talk about. The tomato leaf miner. It's a European pest, but it's originally from South America. Do you think we might get it into North America? Definitely. Um, and here's a, a scary beast. Uh, we found it in Alberta twice. It hasn't established there, it's established in British Columbia, so I'll talk about the brown marmorated stink bug. But lagus bugs, right? Classic, sort of light yellowish sputellum or triangle on its back. Uh, right here, as we follow the leathery wing down, there's a uh, sort of a triangular structure called a cuneus, only in plant bugs, very diagnostic, and then you have the membranous wings, which is cells in it. So tarnished plant bug, this one's Ligus linealaris. There's like you probably have Ligus borealis, Ligus elysis, Ligus keltoni, BC has Ligus hesperus. There's a lot of different species. It's a Ligus bug. So it's a plant bug. They feed on plants. Uh, they pierce and they destroy tissue. But uh, the the immatures look like aphids on crystal meth. They're just like boom, boom, boom. they're everywhere. Um, a little speedier than Rob Ford. But uh, they <laughs> could resist. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> but these things are, are little dorsal ventrally flattened, so they're not big and round. They're flattish. The young, the nymphs, are flattish as well, whereas aphids are kind of globular, right? So 
They like white, sticky cards. Here's the thing. What color are Saskatoon blossoms? What color are strawberry blossoms? What color are just about any kind of fruit, bush fruit we have on the prairies? <laughs> white. So is it any wonder that Ligus bugs are really attracted to white, not yellow? That's why they're not showing up as much on your yellow sticky cards. Is a white sticky card. Who knew? So who sells white sticky cards? They're few and far between. Great Lakes IPM does. But why don't you just take some white plastic and put some tangle foot on it? Ta da! And then you can reuse it. Be careful. When you wash off the old tangle foot, right, the sticky glue, don't use Barsol, because that's toxic, right? Flammable. But also be careful if you're going to use some of those organic uh, solvents like citrusol or any orange, limonene kind of uh, solvents. Have you seen any of these at all? They're uh, sold as organic. I mean, they are extracts from citrus, right? Citrus fruits, whether it's you know grapefruits or oranges or whatever. The active ingredient is limonene. It's a terpene, like you know pine scent smells fresh. It's a terpene, right? Uh, those are defensive compounds. Limonene is actually a nerve poison. It works much like pyrethrum. Who knew? You're soaking in it. <laughs> so, like, if you're feeling a little jittery after washing up the sticky traps, you know why. Uh, so wear gloves, ventilated area, all those sorts of things. Same thing with pine saw. If you get a buzz off a of pine saw, it's because it's a pesticide that a tree produces, right? So uh, they like coming in from legumes, in particular weeds. So not just in your greenhouse, but the surrounding area. Right? Have, you, have, you, have your greenhouse screened? If it's not, then you're going to get these things coming in. Um, nymphs are difficult because they're so fast. They're not sitting there like <coughs> infants. They're very mobile. They're paranoid. Um, saliva is toxic. So it causes not quite as bad as leafhopper burn, but it will cause deformed fruit. It will cause some lesions in, in the, uh, in the uh, leaves. But they like stems, right where all that luscious nutrients coming in. It's feeding the growing point. It's feeding the tips. And that's where the ligus like to go. And of course, that could deadhead your plant. That could abort the bud. That could do all kinds of nastiness. And here, um, there's a nymph, right? It has little wing buds. It's got long antennae, just like an aphid, but it's flat. Roadkill aphid. Uh, but you get you know, feeding damage, right? You know, the lack of growth. So you, you can have some long-lasting effects. So just saying, our old friend, the ligus bug, known on the prairies forever, is, is somewhat problematic. And there's just a recent greenhouse that was uh, uh, having huge problems with it. Now, there is a parasitoid that's been released in Western Canada, mostly for ligus control in alfalfa and canola. So we may see that actually expand and take, take effect to suppress our ligus population. So that's going to probably take about a decade. Just Potato psyllids, they're called jumping plant lights because they do spring, they do jump. Um, this will be on the test later, Dr. Circa, Coccarellia eye, so <laughs> remember that one, just say it if you see it. They're small, they jump when disturbed, the nymphs run very quickly, and like ligus bugs, the nymphs are very dorsal ventrally flattened. Why am I not hanging out a PowerPoint deck? There are excellent fact sheets available. So if you type in, and so that's your homework, type in potato psyllid, up will come a number of hits with a fact sheet for potato psyllid, for ligus bug, all these animals. You've got to learn to be self-reliant, self-directed learning, right? You are a resource. So the nipple damage cause what is called psyllid yellows, just like our leaf hoppers. So you get this excessive wrinkling of the leaves, cupping of the leaves. Is it herbicide damage? I don't use herbicides in my greenhouse. How can that, is it a drift coming in through the vents? So see where that cupping is localized. If it's in the middle of the crop, chances are it could be something like this. The adults are okay. It's just the kids, bending kids. Uh, see some purpling. Is that a, a nutrient deficiency? What's going on with that? So look for that cupping. Uh, Aureus, one of our better known predators for thrips, right? Aureus tristicolor, Aureus insidiosus, the minute pirate bug you can order as a biopatrol. It will tackle the nymphs, not just thrips. Who knew? Uh, thing is, so far as we know, it doesn't overwinter on the prairies, even in the southern prairies. Even, but that's where we see it mostly as it gets blown up with storm systems. You, of all 
provinces should know about storm systems bringing up an insect like diamondback moth in canola. That comes up from Texas. Alberta, we get ours from California. It's just the way the storm systems go. So this is what it looks like. So it's got clear wings like an aphid. It almost looks like a cicada, but it's got really long antennae, just like an aphid. So it's like an aphid on steroids. So, and the nymphs, Barrett said, these are the wing buds. Squishy squish. Is it a scale insect? Look at the fringe. Is it a mealy bug? It's not producing all that wax. So it's a naked mealy bug. Uh, not really, but they're the same group. So it's flat. And they scuttle along like roaches. So even creep back there. there. So um, just know. And then in tomatoes, it causes this purplish and this cupping, this almost like a pseudo gall, but there's nothing inside, strictly speaking, right? There isn't a whole whack of aphids inside. It's that after the fact they've fed and then they've left. That toxic saliva. Oof. So be aware of that. Really uh, bad in tomatoes. Cabbage loopers. Uh, Trichoplusia knee. Not the knights of knee. Any python? Anybody? No? no? Okay. Uh, but uh, this is Trichoplusia. It's a, a, the caterpillar is uniformly green. The moth is a moth. Um, Lots of different animals or plants that it feeds on. Things that it does is a caterpillar is munches on the leaves, just goes and makes these kind of characteristic shot hole damage. Not tiny like a flea beetle, but big damage. Big damage. It's a knock to it. It looks like a bird pooped on it. What are you going to do? Uh, it's a moth. But what's nice is, I showed you this picture before, but here's some people in some styling blue suits. Uh, Gary Jones, he's from Quantum. Um, can't remember his name, he's from Lake Canada. Really cool guy. Should remember his name. Uh, but here, all these pheromone traps so that uh, they can monitor for those moths. If they know they have the moths, the animals will be laying eggs. We're going to have caterpillars soon. I can put out the Bacillus thuringiensis, Barakrishtaki, DTK, Dipel, biocontrol agent, right? So, uh, I talked about leaf hoppers before. The potato leaf hopper. Um, principally is one of the, the worst ones that we're looking at. They have that toxic saliva, you get that chlorotic leaf hopper burn. So be aware of that. There is an egg parasitoid. So there is something available, and I wouldn't recommend it for outdoors. Parasitoid doesn't do that well out in the wild here. Um, we have, anybody who tries to grow ivy, or any kind of grape, or things like that, and the vines just get hammered. That's leafhoppers. Leafhoppers love those kinds of plants. Um, in the greenhouse, they'll go after a number of other kinds of crop, and the, the wasp does better in a greenhouse. So there's what it looks like. It's a little tiny thing. It's not bulbous. It's nowhere near bulbous like an aphid or a potato psyllid. It's streamlined, and they, boing, boing, they are leafhoppers, or they're like squirrels. If you're on that side of the plant, they'll go around, just like a squirrel does. You know, it stays on the other side of the tree, right? Um, and they actually go crab-like. They'll go sideways. Kind of cool to watch. Um, uh, excuse me. Yeah. What is the difference between damage of uh, leaf hopper and uh, the psyllid? Yeah. Um, the potato psyllid tends to be most extreme on tomato, and it's lower down in the crop. These guys uh, can be anywhere in the canopy. Um, the burning doesn't cause the purpling response. Uh, these do get a little cupping, and you get a little brown <coughs> edge to the leaf. That's more of the diagnostic thing, is a little brown edge. Because of saliva, the plants tend to shed that toxin to the edge of the leaf. Um, the jumping plant lice, if we go back, uh, past the cabbage the bird. Doo -doo -doo. So this um, is a more severe curling of the leaf. So it's a real excessive response to, to their saliva. Um, and yes, the adults do jump, but they've got typically absolutely clear wings, whereas leaf hoppers tend to have colored wings. Um, so, so opaque, not transparent wings. So in terms of diagnostics that way. Uh, leaf hoppers have itty bitty little antennae, and these guys have really long antennae, just like aphids. So, um, you, you know, if it has long antennae, could be a psyllid, really short antennae, it's a leaf hopper. 
And when I say short, you can't even see them. So if I go to my leaf hopper, one more, it's in tenure, just a little tiny like hair bristles, just a little bristle by the eye. So if you, I mean, there's nothing. It's like me, shaved. So if you don't see things sticking out like that, um, hair nubbins like Miley, and uh, and you don't have antennae. So uh, I got to throw in the odd pop culture reference. You know, just yeah. to keep things yeah. going. Yo. Just a quick question. I mean, if it's called a potato salad, you're saying it affects tomato crops. Yeah. Would it also be affecting, say, ornamental peppers? Yes, any solanaceous crops like that. Yeah, um, it's going to go in that whole family. Absolutely. It's just we call things as we see them. We're not very imaginative about entomologists. If it's on potato, hey, it's a potato bug, um, and that's where it stems from. But then you know, okay, well that's a taxonomic relationship. <coughs> it feeds on that family. Like if it's on all the rosaceae, so it's going to be on malice, and it's going to be on you know not just apple, but a bunch of stuff, right? I've seen them on chrysanthemum too. Oh, is that right? Oh, different species possibly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's um, uh, over a hundred species <laughs> of, of leafhopper that we've recorded from Alberta. And some of them are really pretty, but they're destructive and they're infuriatingly difficult to, to manage. However, um, what we do know in the field, so if you're getting them responding, so they don't know overwintering, they're coming in in the summer, um, the adults come in and they like to uh, be in the crop and then they'll move upward in the crop. So if you put your yellow sticky cards like you would for white flies, not vertically, but horizontally lower down in the canopy as the adults move to go up to the top of the crop to lay their eggs in early season. If it came in with an early season storm, so they're the, the first generation in, you'll catch a lot of them. This is what we recommend for the landscape, is put your cards out low down horizontally so as they come up you capture them that way. Yeah, thanks for triggering my memory. So that's it. <coughs> we've seen this. Do boring. Okay. Um, Duponchelia fovialis. A little mob introduced from Europe. Uh, Ontario detected it very quickly. It can't overwinter in Canada, uh, so far as we know. It feeds on peppers. This one also likes it low on the canopy where there's some moist conditions. It feeds at the base of stems, crown, leaves, and fruit. So lower down. So you've got to be looking down, not at the new growth, which we typically like to focus on because we don't want to deadhead our plants. We, we know that most of our pests go for that vibrant new growth, right? The tender, defenseless, naive new growth. Well, these like the old and busted stuff, the, the bitter stuff. They like a good bitter stout, right? So that's what they're going for. Um, this is another animal. Uh, it's a moth. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the identification, but the caterpillar is not green like a cabbage looper. The moth has pointed wings as opposed to a broad delta wing like the cabbage looper. It doesn't have bird poop on the wings. I know it's subtle, but it doesn't. This is a more translucent body with some sort of black patches. So that's feeding lower down. Not so. It's a like you say tomatoes more so than uh, peppers. There's another animal, it gets into poinsettias. If you're doing poinsettias, it's called the banana moth. Uh, I didn't bring a picture with me, but this is what we found in Alberta. A grower had it come in with some cuttings, and it actually bores in the stem. You know how fibrous banana is? Well, uh, poinsettia is not too far away from that in terms of being a, a fibrous stemmed plant, right? A woody stemmed plant. And oddly enough, this particular caterpillar was, was staying on between cropping cycles of poinsettia by breeding in rotting wood material that was in the greenhouse. Like they were using pallets as a flooring material. And so the, the pallets were getting wetted and the wood was rotting. And so that caterpillar was actually persisting, reproducing in that rotting wood material. It was fibrous, it was moist enough, it was uh, munchy enough, it wasn't uh, pressure treated, it wasn't uh, you know, kiln dried anymore. So it was getting into the stems of poinsettia and causing the whole poinsettia to collapse. So we do, it doesn't overwinter in Canada, but the banana moth has been seen routinely coming in with shipments of poinsettia from, from other sources. So just, just saying, just like this one, you have to be careful when you're bringing material in, or even if it's not material that you brought in, it was, uh, say not in your tomatoes, but it was some other plant material that you brought in from a, a foreign source. So there is that risk. So keep your eyes open for that. Okay, greenhouse white fly with the lovely name Trailurodes vipor aureorum. Everybody knows greenhouse white fly. It's that lovely white fly. 
that has its wings flattish over the body, right? It's the white fly scale has these little filaments of wax coming off of it, easy to identify. Sweet potato white fly, Mimesia tabassi, it has the wings tent-like over the body, right? The immature stage is not as waxy as the greenhouse white fly. The pupil stage is sort of a flattened material, whereas the greenhouse white fly is like a, a steep-sided pancake. But then there was this beast out of California, the silverleaf white fly. It was called the bee biotype. Then they decided, anyway, um, that uh, it needs its own species name because it wasn't actually biologically reproducing with the old tabassi. It was different enough. And what was curious about this one is it was resistant to a lot of the pesticides that were being used at the time. So here all of a sudden this bee biotype was a really difficult beast to work with, the carbamates, the organophosphates, just weren't doing it. Now there's the Q biotype. It hasn't been given its own species name yet. It's still Babesia tabassi, but it's called Q, Q biotype. And it's originally from uh, Europe, uh, Spain, and it's resistant to the neonicotinoids. These are the new nicotine-like insecticides. You know what is metacloprid is the most common one, acetamiprid, thiacloprid, uh, biomethoxam. There's a few of them, all with the same mode of action. It's a nicotine receptor uh, toxin. So it's a neurotransmitter. It interferes with uh, nerve transmission. And uh, that was a really good systemic that we would use to combat white flies. So this thing is uh, in Europe. We're hoping it doesn't come to North America. Uh, there have been some reports of it showing up, i.e. a grower was applying a product, a, a neonic, to their crop and not getting satisfactory results, i.e. the white flies <coughs> weren't dying. It hasn't been confirmed through DNA analysis whether it was this particular biotype or not. But this is why when you use, and this isn't just for neonicotinoids, but for any product, whether it's a biocontrol agent, it's a hex, if you use that, um, if it's you know any kind of uh, product, synthetic or organic or otherwise, um, you need to go in after the application and ensure that it had the expected impact to find out whether or not that population has resistance, or maybe you did an incorrect mix, or an incorrect release rate, or the bios were dead on arrival or they, not as many were alive in the package when you received the package because the driver stopped for donies on the highway and it froze, that kind of thing. Hey, it happens. Uh, so you need to go in after any kind of corrective measure and verify that it worked, right? Because you don't want to throw good money after that. But that's why we're uh, a little bit concerned. Here are the two different white flies. Sweet potato white fly has got a uh, pretty much naked, immature stage. The wings are tent-like. Here's the greenhouse white fly. It has more waxy filaments on the immature stage, and the wings tend to be more flat over the body. There you go. You're white fly doctors now. Um, this is work by Dave Gillespie out of Agriculture Canada uh, in, in BC. And what he found in BC greenhouses, and they have spread across the prairies to a certain extent, are some aberrant strains of green peach aphid, Mises persisi. Um, they have the unmitigated goal of actually feeding on the tops of the leaves. They're like, hey, we're tough. <laughs> right? They're hiding underneath the leaves. They're uh, a little bit more robust. They're getting on the fruit and contaminating the fruit with their dead bodies. It means you have to wash your fruit before you sell it, even more vigorously than before. You can get molds growing on the fruit. And that's not just for, uh, for uh, veggies. It's also for ornamentals. There's another... Uh, why, why that's there twice, there we go, a pink strain. And it's causing some excessive cupping and disfigurement in, in uh, plant leaves, especially tomatoes. And this little puppy is pinkish. But it's a green peach aphid can. But it's pink. But it's green peach aphid. But it's pink. So these color changes. I mean, we know that melon aphid um, can have all number of different color variants depending on what it's feeding on and what its life stage is. It's lighter colored when it's young, darker when it's older. And this is routinely a pinkish color. And um, you can see that it, uh, you know, you can see the mixed in populations. Sometimes the pink is really noticeable. 
and not as, uh, uh, as, as clear in others. But eventually you'll see as a population as a whole, it tends to be pink. Take home lesson, two of them. This is uh, um, the, the work that was done by Dave, and he has his Agassiz Research Station strain. So it's generic green peach aphid lab rat stain strain. And they're the little circles. So I have a single female, because they reproduce parthenogenetically, they don't need mates, right? They just clone themselves. This is the rate of increase. So after 12 days from a single female, there's about 40 offspring. Wow, that's, that's quite the reproductive rate. But then the pink strain or tobacco strain, uh, snapdragon strain. So the tobacco strain, after the same amount of time, there's 70 agents, almost double. Look at this thing, the snapdragon strain. After the same amount of time, there's almost two and a half times more aphids. From one aphid, you have 90 in under two weeks. And you never find just one aphid, right? <coughs> so the reproductive capacity, so when you thought, you know, I'm going to scout my crop on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis, I can usually stay on top of my aphids by looking every two weeks. You almost have to look every three days with this thing. So if you're seeing and experiencing a rapid increase in aphid populations, you might have one of these aberrant strains courtesy of a supplier from uh, another province. So it's not that all BCE things, no. These are spot detections, isolated detections, but you have to stay on top of it. Because this isn't a whole new species, right? It's a population. They've had a mutation where it accelerates their birth rate, uh, their developmental rate. It, uh, smaller body size, because they're pretty reproducing so quickly, they tend to be a bit smaller. The parasitoids don't like them so much. Eh, my kids will starve on that, right? They don't want to lay their eggs there. So the predators go, well, that's not even a mouth. I, I don't want tater tots, I want a baked potato, right? So they're, they're, you're not seeing as effective biocontrol. And they're also, somewhat more resistant to the insecticide. So these are almost like super bugs of a sort. So you need to determine, do I have to take extra corrective measures? Increase my rates, increase my release rates of bios, you know, rogue out this population, you know, make sure my greenhouse is clean so that it's gone. If you detect that the population reproductive rate is excessively higher, because there's natural variation in the population. Just a couple more, and then we can have a, a chance to talk. Tuna absoluta, it's kind of a neat name, Tuna absoluta. Anyway, uh, not such a great bug. Little tiny moth, uh, it is on uh, tomato and potato as well as a couple of ornamentals, and it's a leaf miner. So these leaves are not gray from botrytis or powdery mildew. They've been killed from the inside, completely scoured out. Someone took a melon baller and scooped out all the innards. Right, so this little caterpillar goes inside the leaf. So much for a foliar application, right? Unless it's, you know, unless, if it can't get through the leaf, it'll never get at the caterpillar. Uh, they'll get into and mine at the surface of the fruit. So this is a, a, a fairly problematic animal. We're worried about it because with the international trade in plant material, it's entirely possible this could be introduced to North America like that. Um, non diapausing What that means is, it, regardless of light levels, say you don't use supplementary lighting in your greenhouse and you have some low light tolerant plants, as long as there's food, it will continue to reproduce, continue to develop. Insects, when they know winter's coming, days are getting shorter, the plants are getting kind of bitter and tough and chewy because they're hardening off, it's not going to be a good thing. I know, I'm going to spend the winter in a state of suspended animation. I'm going to either cement it as an egg, I'm going to go down into the soil as a caterpillar, I'm going to go down into the soil as a pupa, right, that, that chrysalis stage, right? Sometimes, some butterflies mostly, will overwinter as an adult. Right? And they go hide away in a rock pile or a wood pile. But these things won't. These little moths will say, hey, as long as there's food, I'm into it, I don't care if I don't see. I'm a moth, I can fly at night anyway. Right? So, uh, it takes about a month, a little bit longer, and that's not very warm, 20 degrees. You get up around 25 degrees, 27 degrees, you're cutting it by a third to a half. 
So every three weeks, now you've got a generation cycle through your crop. The females, they, they rabbits don't hold a candle to these guys, right? Uh, rabbits have a litter, cats have a litter, they might have a few litters in the season. These things pumping out the eggs, right? And so, good luck finding that, right? Very difficult to detect those eggs. The larvae, I mean, once it hatches, it's burrowing into the leaf. Out of sight, out of mind. How are you going to attack this thing? Uh, the pupae, actually, now they're finding out that the pupae will fall down into the soil or somewhere on the floor and you can go after them with hypoaspis, right? Uh, Mele, well now it's, what is it, um, Stratiolalips, right? Simidus, and they've changed the name. What are you going to do? Uh, but that's a predatory mite that you usually have in the soil for fungus nets and thrips pupae. Well, they'll go and chew on this as well. Uh, same will Phinolides, which is normally an aphid predator, but it'll actually take down a caterpillar. Who knew? So they're within the plant material, right? They'll attack any developmental stage, young, middle-aged, old, stem, leaf, fruit. Uh, it does like the new stuff, of course, because that's where the most nutrition is. Uh, there are pheromone traps available. So there are pheromones for Tuta absoluta. You use with the pheromone trap a sticky card, basically, and that way you can detect the moths. So there's a whole lot of science. Um, in Canada, there are regulations. So like I say, you can go to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, it wasn't Latin, CFIAs are, are, are guided. Uh, so they have new U.S. requirements for tomatoes shipped from Canada. So the U.S. is paranoid, uh, as well they should be. New requirements for tomatoes entering Canada from countries infested. So if you're trying to order material in, there may be some roadblocks, depending on where you're sourcing the material. Um, so there's a pest fact sheet. There you go. You've got your own color pictures. You can have your own kill electrodes, no trees, right? Download it to your electronic device. Look at the PDF. Don't print it out. You must print it out for the rest of your staff. Just one sheet, not hand it out like I did here today. Uh, so uh, I tried to reduce it. Only one page. One half a day page instead of a big handout. So uh, definitely the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has that stuff. Where am I going? There is where I'm going. Uh, Europe. Don't. So now we go to Europe. And Tutta Absoluta has its own website. It's as famous as Miley Cyrus once again. There you go. So um, it tells you where it is in Europe. Uh, it tells you where it is in Europe. And if we scan across in the Middle East and it's in Europe, and like, oh man. Uh, thankfully, if we go to North America, it is blissfully Tutta free. But tuta, absoluta, that's where it originates, Central and South America. So it's got news about workshops, it has a photo gallery, uh, discussions about how to manage it. So there's all kinds of, um, so I'll people up on this page. So there's all kinds, so recent photo galleries, recent discussions, recent map points where it's been found, right? recent reports, publications. So there's all kinds of material that's out there for you. Uh, you don't have to rely on you know, annual meetings, although annual meetings are good. Don't forget, annual meetings are where you start to begin to discover this stuff and you start to discuss it. But carry on that conversation through social media. Carry on that conversation, that learning journey by exploring the web for specific resources. So I'll finish with brown marmorated stink bug. All marmorated refers to is little white markings on the antennae and on the side. It's a stink bug, but this one's particularly uh, bad. It originates from China, and it's, we found in the U.S., we found it in Alberta. The two detections were central Alberta, Red Deer, uh, and Airdrie. Airdrie's just north of Calgary, Red Deer's between Edmonton and Calgary. They were associated with equipment shipped to a specific location, i.e. a retailer, uh, not a greenhouse retailer. Uh, it was equipment that was shipped up, and it was in the equipment, and one piece of equipment had in excess of 200 stink bugs. These guys like hitching a ride. That's how a lot of insects get around the world. San Jose scale. It's from San Jose, California. <coughs> it's worldwide. How would that happen? Scale insects don't 
fly. Well, males do, but the females don't. How does he get around? Transporting of horticultural material, plant material. Gets shipped around the world, there goes the scale. These things are getting shipped around with equipment. How do you get from China? Probably a container ship. So we had it in Alberta. We've been monitoring. I've been, um, there's two of us, been uh, setting up traps in the Red Deer and Airdrie area, hoping to see no stink bugs in our traps. And knock on wood, we didn't find any this year. And we, we were trapping specifically around where that one piece of equipment came in with a ton of bugs in 2012. And we can lit lit legitimately call these bugs because they're true bugs. Just saying, everything else is an insect. These are true bugs. Um, so little nymphs, they don't have the wings that are formed. The eggs are laid in clusters on the leaves. What's so problematic about this? As a grower, they'll feed on ornamental plants. So they're like a ligus bug in the sense that they'll feed on the leaves, the growing tips, the stems, the fruit. For vegetable growers, same thing. They will go after a number of different vegetables. There's over 230 crop species they've been recorded from in the United States. It is firmly established in eastern Canada, or central Canada, and eastern United States. If you go to the uh, city of Toronto, they got a great website on brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food has a great fact sheet on brown marmorated stink bug. It's now established in the interior of British Columbia. They have some great information. Tracy Huppelheiser is a pest manager for the, the province. She's done a great bunch of work. And ideally, if you want to hear about someone to bring out for a talk, get Tracy. She's a, a really good wealth of information. And she's been talking about this one and the spotted wing drosophila, in case any of you grow field uh, uh, fruit, strawberries, raspberries, currants, that kind of thing. Haven't found it in Saskatoon yet. Uh, it's a fruit fly. A little tiny thing, you know, when you bring the bananas home, they got all those flies up your nose and in your ear. It's one of those, Drosophila suzukii, the spotted wing Drosophila. Problem with that one, most fruit flies, they just glue their eggs to rotten fruit. They need rotten fruit because the larva only has these little fangs called the cephalopharyngeal skeleton. All it can do is tear away an already rotten material. So it goes after overripe fruit. The spotted wing Drosophila. The female doesn't just glue her egg to the fruit. She has a saw on her butt. And that's what she uses, it's just like a thrips. She saws into unripe fruit, ripening fruit, not just overripe fruit. So they're a huge problem. So now that the maggot is put inside the fruit, then it can just go feeding away. So it's, it's, a, it's a serious pest of fruits, and it's also established in BC, and actually I set some traps out at our orchard, our fruit orchard, or on the Oaks College campus. Guess what we found this year? Spotted wing drosophila. So it's now in Alberta. Be warned. Um, so if you're doing any kind of fruit, um, bush fruit outside, or strawberries outside, raspberries outside, this thing's on its way. Um, but this critter attacks a stink load, pardon the pun, of uh, plants. It goes after stone fruit, palm fruit, droop fruit, veggies, ornamentals, you name it. So it, it has a very broad host range. Uh, and it's something for homeowners, too, because if you are a resource in, in your community, are you not? People go, found this, what's this? Right? They bring in stuff. It's a dead plant, it's a stick, it's a critter, right? They, they, they see you as a resource. Um, you're going to get calls. Just saying, Glenn. Uh, you're going to get calls. <laughs> about, I've got all these stink bugs in my house, or I've got all these bugs in my house, and it reeks. They literally stink more so than the average stink bug, and they like to hang out like in huge numbers. Uh, Google on you, oh, sorry, search YouTube, and there will be several videos of people freaking out because there's so many stink bugs in their house in uh, Maryland, Washington, D.C., etc. So, um, yeah, the people are just like, they pan the camera, and there's hundreds if not thousands of these things coming in. Just like lady beetles coming. You guys ever had box elder bugs? Some people call them Halloween bugs or whatever coming into your house by the hundreds, yeah? You know, cut down your neighbor's box elder. Uh, no, um, didn't say that. Oh, no, I'm being recorded. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, you're saying, because it doesn't really do a lot of harm to the tree, but those bugs are coming into the home and they don't stink. And actually, the, the box elder bug is in the family Ropalidae, which is the scentless plant bug. It can't stink. Who knew? Uh, 
So those guys are just sort of creepy because there's so many of them. These things, there's creepy because there's so many of them, but they produce a really foul odor coming into the home. So be, be aware. There are efforts afoot to have the uh, insect have a biocontrol agent, a wasp, a parasitic wasp. They went back to China. They said, okay, what's keeping this not a problem? It's not a problem in China. And it goes from the south of China to the north of China, and so it can overwinter here quite easily. It's not just a tropical state bug. It's uh, very much temperate to north temperate. So they're looking at a wasp. They, they found a few wasps that parasitize it. But the problem is it parasitizes other stink bugs. There you go. Like, That's a problem, Ken. Uh, it is. Are you familiar with Podiasis maculaventris, the spiny soldier bug? That's a biocontrol agent that's marketed. It's a native stink bug. It preys on cabbage looper. It preys on uh, tuta absoluta. And it's a great predator. It hunts down caterpillars outside and in your greenhouse. That could be vulnerable to that parasitoid. So we don't want to bring in a biocontrol agent that is going to kill indiscriminately. Yes, it'll kill the bad guys, but it'll kill some good guys. It's like saying, oh, we have gang activity in Saskatoon. I know, let's nuke the city. We got the gangbangers, right? But how many innocent citizens did you also eliminate? So we don't want to be too rash in what we bring in. So right now, we're worried about what's gonna come uh, from China. How easily is this thing transported? I was at a meeting last November, so a year ago in November, the Entomological Society of Canada had its annual scientific conference in Edmonton. And we actually had uh, someone from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency who's been doing research in Switzerland and in China trying to find a parasitoid for brown marmorated stink bug. And so she was telling people about it. Some guy sticks up his hand and goes, um, what does this thing really look like? And so she flashes up a picture and goes, okay, is this it? And sure enough, he had it in a vial. He'd actually found it in his hotel room in Edmonton that day. And it crawled out of his suitcase in the middle of November. But the thing is, he was just down in Washington. And of course, they have a fall, unlike us. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, and he, it must have crawled into his suitcase when he was at the conference in Washington. Just like that. It's like bed bugs. They're everywhere. Uh, that's how easily they're transported. Now I got you all creeped out over bed bugs. I checked my bed. <laughs> so, yes, I do that. Uh, I don't sleep in a body condom or anything. Uh, so, when we say polyphagous, what it means is a wide host range. It'll feed on a lot of different plants. So, keep your eyes open for this one. Um, you may see it in fruit crops, then it may move into the greenhouse. You may see it moving into people's homes. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll conclude uh, the formal part of it. But uh, certainly, I'm, I'm here and at your disposal to answer any and all questions. So, but first of all, I have to say thank you very much for the warm welcome and the opportunity to come speak with you again this year. I sadly had to miss last year, but it's really great to be back. So thanks very much. On behalf of the association, we have a little token of appreciation. Oh, sweet. And thank you very really much. really enjoyed the two hours have flown by. You're such a welcome. And I stayed on time. You're very good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So yeah, um, we've got a few minutes. Actually, you can, you know, I know it's just a coffee break, but we've got some time. Yeah. yeah um, I've got chrysanthemum a crop, and I found uh, like a seed on it this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, didn't, I couldn't find damage per se, so I didn't do anything about it. But I was noticing. No. Do you clean out between crops? So is there anywhere that they can overwinter? Do you cool yeah, your, your uh, house it's down? A year round. Oh, it's a year round. So then what happens is you can potentially get the population to start to build. So you know, invariably leaf hoppers, lagus bugs, many insects see your greenhouse with all that lovely heat and all those volatiles given off from the plants. Now, understand, insects don't have like the nose of a dog. They don't have you know the, the taste palate of a wine snob. Uh, they, no, anything against wine snobs or anything, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, they have receptors and they, they, they don't need to taste everything in the world or smell everything in the world, but there's a few things 
that they cue in on, right? It's a host odor. And, and uh, oddly enough, a lot of plants share the same kind of odors. Um, and so, the, although the Ligus bug goes, oh, I really like alfalfa, I really like alfalfa, I like lamb's quarters, I like, you know, all these things. And then he goes, oh, hey, it's getting cold out, all that stuff's, you know, hardening off, but I smell something. And it probably just one of those constituents. So they could be attracted into your greenhouse, even though it's not a preferred host plant. Once they get in, they start feeding. Maybe it's not the best host plant, so it doesn't provide all the nutrition. So either they can't reproduce, i.e. the eggs don't have enough nutrition. The larvae or nymphs don't have enough nutrition, so they don't reach adulthood. So I can, you know, the adult can feed and be sustained, like bread and water, but not enough to you know, have vibrant kids. So in that case, you might just see them, and then there's no harm, no foul. But as it turns out, this one greenhouse in California, they were getting in, they were reproducing, they were doing a considerable amount of damage. So it's a matter of maybe you got away with it one year, but the populations might increase. So you might want to do some aggressive trapping. Um, here's something that's old-fashioned, but uh, strawberry growers use this in California. They use a vacuum. Like they'll hook up a gator or a tractor, and they have a big hose, and they just sort of, they hoover their strawberry crop. They physically vacuum the ligus out, because it is a fairly sizable animal to a certain extent, and they take them out through vacuuming. So I don't know if you want to reverse a leaf blower, or, I mean, you have to be careful, right, because you don't want to harm the plants, but, you know, a, a, you know, a reasonable force suction, and you can actually physically lift them that way. Something else, their behavior in the spring Say that they're really uh, low behavior in the winter. Uh, they start getting more active in the spring. What happens is, is their natural biology is they overwinter in leaf litter, hedgerows, shelter belts, wherever there's an accumulation of organic matter that they can get under and it serves as an insulating blanket. So the first thing they do is they come out, what's out first? Well, what we call our weeds, or what the plant says, I am just a plant. Uh, so they come out on those early emerging plants and they're feeding. And then they move into the alfalfa crop, or they move into the canola crop, and they're already mated. So the females are already mated. They don't have to go hunting for males. As soon as they get into the crop, they're laying eggs. And it's the nymphs that generally do most of the damage, not the adults. Adults come later, so they're out there in August, September. So if you can, depending on the sequencing of your crop, is put out some track plants. Put out some lamb's quarters, put out some alfalfa, well, not alfalfa, it'd be impractical. Some canola, throw some canola. Get it into flower, let it bolt, let it flower, and they'll run to that. Or any kind of legume, for that matter, if you want to put something out, and, and have that in flower, so out of sequence. And the ligus make them go, uh -huh, and they'll go to that. That's a trap plant. And, th and then you just treat those plants, because you're never going to eat them, you're never going to sell them, or you, or you rogue them out. And increasingly, growers are having a lot of success using a lure or a bait or a trap plant like that. So that's, that's something. For ligus or leaf hoppers? For ligus. Leaf hoppers, you can do the same thing by using beans. Uh, any kind of vine, an ivy or anything like that, grow that up, and the, the leaf hoppers love to go to those plants as a trap crop, right? Before your crop of interest is either in fruit or is flowering, right? Or even before it's established. You want to get those things if they've been overwintering in your greenhouse to come out to that, to that trap. And that's common for any kind of crop. Say, if you're doing a crop <coughs> cycle where it's not continuous cropping, where you, you know, pulled out all your veggies, you said, well, you know what, it's gonna open up the vents and turn off the heat and freeze things out, but insects have a way of finding where that heat sink is, right? Residual heat in the cement slab, you know, where the greenhouse comes up to the header house, there's residual heat there, they're hanging out. So you, you, know, you close the vents, you fire up the boiler again, you reheat the greenhouse, but before you seed your new crop, before you lay out your new crop, put out some pots of preferred host that you've been growing in another area, maybe even just the header house under some lamps. And then as the greenhouse reaches operating temperature, whatever made it through that freezing period or that cold period, they'll gravitate to those sacrificial plants Treat those or take them out. You've reduced the starting population, right? You've reduced that threat, that initial threat. Any chemicals for the people? Uh, not indoors. Nothing's registered for that matter, honestly. That's the problem with insects that are out, you know, landscape pests, that when they come into the greenhouse, they're not labeled for it. So uh, what we, you know, uh, being recorded. Uh, but what happens is, and I can say this honestly, legitimately, and legally, is when you use a product for, say, another animal, 
Well, if leaf hoppers are there, they're going to be exposed to that product as well. So it all depends on what your regular routine pesticide management program is. As far as biocontrols go, like we say, there's the one um, uh, parasitoid that is available, but um, it's, there's not a lot been done with these because it's a sporadic kind of problem. But we're seeing it more and more, so more and more research is being done. So right now we're at the beginning of the, of the hill, and hopefully by the time, you know, in a couple of years, we'll have a lot more to know about the hill. Uh, leaf hoppers, massively damaging to, to grape. And so Ontario, Quebec, well, certainly California, a lot of research is being done on leafhopper management. And the more that they can learn, the more that we can learn about greenhouse leafhopper management. We had a huge leafhopper problem last year. It's a bit better this year, but we have a year-round greenhouse as well, and we grow 28 different crops. So there's something that everyone likes. You are a massive. I know, it's true. It's, it's brutal. Terrible. But see, that's the problem. I mean, to a certain extent, vegetable growers who, who, who you know, have very discrete set crop cycles, and they have a, an interval, um, that's the e one of the easier ways of managing. But if it's either vegetable, where you're doing continuous cropping, like you're taking alternate rows, which is, yeah. intercropping is kind of tough because you've got this mature plant with a density of insects that a mature plant can withstand, then you put in these seedlings, right? And these insects go, oh, yeah. And they jump onto those vulnerable, less tolerant, less <coughs> well-defended young plants. So that's the problem with intercropping, but I understand the economics of it, that you want a continuous yield. When you're growing with 28 different species, wow, I mean, that's challenging. I mean, there's people who grow hundreds of different species or cultivars, um, and it's continuous. And so it is challenging, especially if you have those um, hospital plants you bring in to rejuvenate, right? They're infested with material. You've got something that's been going for 20 years as a tropical, and they just, there's your scale insect, there's your mealybug source, right? It's just, it's a mealybug factory, and it's going to infest everything else. But I don't want to get rid, get rid of old Fred, right? Um, so there are challenges. When you say it was bad one year, less so the next year, are you getting, is it that it's through the summer growing season, or is it through the winter period? I think it's worse in the spring, but they seem really attracted to like we have mint and oregano. Yeah. I didn't realize they could damage tomatoes so yeah. much. Absolutely. So then what you think about is, okay, if that's the one, and see, this is the, the, the wisdom, the knowledge that all of you have in your head. You know exactly what was getting hit hardest, which may not be in the scientific literature, is someone doing all host preference studies, especially for herbs and, and essential oil plants and things like that. So then you need to know, okay, I go look at that first and, and take the temperature of that crop. Is there something there early on before it spreads to the other species that, that might be vulnerable? Number two is uh, maybe you don't grow that crop, right? It's going to cost you so much to treat it or you lose so much yield. What's the point? If, if, until we get tools that are useful. So these are hard economic decisions you have to make, even though you go, well, God, man, I can sell all that you grow, but if only you could grow it, right? So, but maybe you have to find a different way of growing it. But that parasitoid that parasitizes the egg, we phoned around all over and no one had controls for leaf hoppers. Is that available now, or is it, are there certain... When I say something's available, it means it has actually been commercially produced, okay, so it and it should be, but it's not going to be in high volumes yet. Not like when we look at uh, Phytolides or Phidias or, you know, Incarcia. You know, you got Incarcia up the wazoo now. Uh, in all different manner and styles. Uh, so this particular wasp, you, you know, there might be a single lab that's producing it. So I know Cooper and Biobank started producing it. Um, oh, actually, I think Cooper might be. But uh, so you just check um, the, the major companies, see if they've got it. Um, it's worth asking a rep if they can access it because I mean, Podiasis macula ventris, that spined soldier bug, the predatory snake bug that feeds on cabbage loopers. It was a dude in Vancouver rearing him in his basement. I mean, that was it, right? And then he said, oh, this is nuts. It's, it's, you know, so, um, you know, not everything is produced commercially. Some of it's in university labs. Okay, we know there's something there. Now we've got to commercialize it. But li rearing livestock is expensive. Ask any of the biocontrol companies. It's a very risky proposition because you're growing livestock, not producing a chemical, not extracting an oil from a plant. Yeah, it's difficult. 
Yes. We just in our personal gardens in our community, uh, we lost our cabbage to we believe cabbage maggot. maggot. Okay. So this coming year, can we replant or what do we do to prevent that? Well, Pelia, that's the genus of, of, of root maggots. We did some work. Actually, I got to play in Dr. Mercer's backyard, not his house, but Crop <laughs> Diversification Center North uh, for a few seasons. And we were doing some trials with Bavaria bassiana against uh, cabbage maggot. And what happens is, is the fly, it pupates in the soil. So can you rotate the crop, like go to another patch of soil, right? Don't put your cabbages back right there because those adults will come out again. Number two, when the fly, this is a behavioral quirk, what it does is it circles down and lands on a plant and goes, yeah, this, this will work for my kids, I want to be sure. Takes off, drifts a bit, and then comes down again and lands on another plant. And it does that three or four times. If it lands on a non-host plant during these three or four landings, it flies away a distance because it says, no, I need a big, thick tap root, or I need you know, a, a large food source for my larvae. And if there's a non-host plant, it's going to compete. I mean, even it knows about weed control, <laughs> right? So it knows that if there's going to be competition. It's going to be a smaller tap root, not as much food for my kids. I'll go find someone else. So that's another thing is in your garden, don't just plant a monoculture. I know it's more difficult to harvest. It might even be more difficult to weed. But don't take offense, it's not all about you, <laughs> okay? It's about the food, it's about the plant. Look at how you produce from the plant's perspective. If you can maximize plant needs and not your convenience, you know, no, it's not about you, precious snowflake, it's about the plant, right? We're all about the plants. And even I can say that, I'm a bug guy, it's all about the plants. And so if you do that, then if you start having different crops or intercropping, then the fly's going to land on a non-host. And so don't plant anything else in the cabbage family nearby. Um, and lastly, is they emerge when there's a big enough plant that it's not at risk of frost, it's not at risk of uh, dying out. So the, the, uh, the flies are coming out, and there's two generations usually in, in the prairies. So it comes out in the early summer. And what you could do is, as you've planted your plants, so the month of June is put a spun polyester fiber row cover, like remain, over your plants. And that's if you've planted it in another plot, right? Otherwise, you're like, the fly comes out and goes, oh, this is gorgeous in here. I like this. There's no predators. I've got cabbage. Thanks. Uh, so what you want to do is, when you're sure there's no flies coming out of that soil, you can put that remain on, and the flies can't physically land to lay their eggs at the base of the plant, which is where they're laying their eggs so that the larvae go down into the root. Lastly, the research we were doing was with Bavaria bassiana, that's a botanic garden. It's a fungus. It's a soil fungus originally. And while it's not registered for, for field use in this capacity, it has been successfully used in the United States because the fungus gets in the soil. And what we were measuring is, as the adult flies come up out of the soil, they pick up the spores. And then are they then succumbing to the disease as an adult? And we actually saw some good results. So um, you might see that product relabeled for vegetable use later on. So uh, someone recommended to put lime in. Would that help? Well, OK. Uh, that's a very serious chemotherapy because you're killing your soil, not just the pupae, not just the flies in the soil, right? not just the larvae. I mean, what is lime going to do to your plant? Mm -hmm. I'll defer to Dr. Merz's expertise with regards to soil amendments and, and what that does to nutrient availability, pH, water, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you, but no, it's, it's honestly, it's hurting the plant probably more than it's hurting the flies. Now, I'm really leery of soil amendments like that, especially physical amendments that mess with pH, right? Anything else? Well, I was 